multiplicative field effect, right? Multiplicative. It's not complicated. Someone's got like, I don't understand you. I try to keep things actually extremely simple. Now, the spatial area of this magnifying glass is actually less than that of my hand. Talk about multiplicative field effect. Like one stick, right? Any child could take ten sticks and break them. You tie them all together, and I know the ancient Roman symbol for what that represents, and essentially become unbreakable. Now, the light that falls on my hand is incredibly innocent, but I could take the same area of the light that falls on my hand and concentrate it, and you can literally burn rock. There's actually thousands of YouTube videos. People uh, using uh, Fresnel lenses, which is basically a, a simple plastic magnifier. Most of them are plastic. You know, to burn through rock or to burn steel. Some people have ingeniously learned how to do crude welding using a magnifying glass, essentially. Multiplicative field effects. So that's not complicated, right? It's no different than talking about point source energy. I'm going to make a declarative statement that's 100% true, and if you believe me on nothing, please trust me when I tell you this is true, and it's not my opinion or feeling or belief that this is true. But all major inventions of this world and of the future, I said major, must be necessitatively point source energy inventions with, of course, a multiplicative field effect. All lasers, all magnets are point source energy fields. Point source energy takes the form, actually it takes many different forms. It's either uh, anti-spatially directed or it is spatially directed, in which case we're talking about scalar, for example, or we're actually um, like, I, I should have brought one in here. I've shown them to you many times. My buddy, the used to be the largest seller of magnets in the, in the United States, George Mizell, that you super magnet man on YouTube, he actually ordered them from China that way. There's nowhere else I know that you could buy them. I got seven of them, I think. They're pyramidal-shaped magnets. One time you actually say pyramid power. It focuses the magnetic flux to a point, to extremely high Tesla field at the point and they have incredible properties for all sorts of unique testing. Now the depth of the field of the super powerful magnetic flux is extremely shallow but this is an example of a multiplicative field effect. You've taken all that magnetic flux whether it be a spherical magnet or a cube shaped magnet or a, you know a rectangular like a two by one uh, two by two by one inch magnet and you've brought it into a point and so, all of a sudden, it has near-magical properties. Interestingly enough, field propulsion craft actually take advantage of the right-hand rule and create a force vector 90 degrees to the vector of acceleration. This video is not about UFOs or what technically. I shouldn't call them UFOs, right? It's like using the word ghost. People say, God, I don't believe in ghosts. Let's just say disembodied being, right? And uh, everybody has this crazy idea in their head when they hear the word UFO. Let's just say field propulsion craft. You actually create a strong force vector 90 degrees to the vector of acceleration. Simplex right-hand rules. So you have a multiplicative field effect. What the power source is, I don't know. I've got an idea of what it is, and it has to be a point source energy field. Because an AC generator doesn't generate power. I've said this a million times. It actually manifests power. Yeah. It includes a temporal variant for the manifestation of power. There's not like a hydroelectric or wind, for example. You know, transference from the kinetic energy of blowing wind into the generation of power. It goes into an arch form, which every AC generator is, and of course it manifests power because there's a temporal variant. And every AC generator, which is an AC manifester, is just an inside-out magnet. It's kind of brilliant. You introduce a temporal variable to uh, an arch form, which is what a generator is, and uh, it generates power. It's an inside-out magnet with a temporal variable. There has to be actually a solid state, no moving part, particular structure that introduces a temporal variable, and I've got many ideas what it is. Do I know what it is? I certainly don't. And this video is not about this. I'm interested in actually talking about point source energy. Point source energy. Now, it is true, of course, space has no properties. This is something Nikola Tesla said over and over again. It's one time he nearly foams the mouth at relativity. And quantum four is this idea that you can bend space and time. But is space a dilutant? Yeah. In the case of uh, 
And of course, light and radio are the exact same thing. They're EMF, like a reflector telescope. Now, if you're standing at the same level as uh, the primary mirror, like on a reflector telescope, you can see it here. Okay, you see there's a hole in the middle of the reflector telescope. All the light is gathered. It's not really gathered. It's actually directed. And it takes a large spatial area, the larger the primary mirror here is at the bottom, and of course it directs it to a secondary, and the secondary directs it towards the hole in the center of that primary, and that's where a actual large CCD, the same thing that's inside of a, a digital camera, except it's a lot larger and a lot more uh, sensitive, actually takes the light and it you know, sends it to computers for interpolation to draw out even more noise. It's actually taking all of that light, but the larger the area, the better the collection is. So is space a dilutant of energy? In the case of EMF, does it matter whether it's visible light or radio light? Is this any different? And of course, radio is EMF. Visible light, ultraviolet, gamma radiation, all of those are EMF electromagnetic radiation, specifically the coaxial circuit of light. Is this any different than the visible light telescope? You have the primary, which is the big dish. It actually sends it to the reflector cone right up here at the end that's sticking out on the end of a tripod. And that redirects it right towards the hole in the center there, and that goes to a receptor. And then the noise is further eliminated. Now that's actually taking a large spatial area. Now, we obviously can't see or hear radio. But in the case of light, when you're actually standing at the same level of the primary, you, your little eyeballs, you're seeing the exact same thing every little eyeball-shaped section of that primary element on the telescope is seeing. Can we actually use the word accurately? And of course, we all think this way. Just as the entire world is mentally defective in thinking that light travels and it has a speed, we think, well, it's magnifying the light. Everybody on Earth thinks that about either whether it be a reflector telescope or even a refractor telescope. Nobody on Earth, even though this does the exact same thing, this uh, radio telescope dish, the larger it is, the better, the better the game, because everybody is, everything is about signal over noise. Nobody considers this to be magnifying the signal. Some people actually talk like that about radio telescopes, but we're actually taking spatial dilution of a signal and eliminating out something else, which is noise. So is it the truth, even though that space has no properties, it is the, and it's not a substance, it's not a medium, space has no properties at all. Space is after, by the way, the after effect of a divergent magnetic field. Is space the ultimate diluter of energy? Everything is about signal over noise. The same is true, I have some really expensive, uh, you know, long, called shotgun microphones, you could actually point it at something and you can hear the gain go up. They're actually directional. Uh, parabolic microphones, you've actually seen those. They basically look like dish, like the primary element on a telescope or uh, primary element uh, main reflector on a radio telescope. Point source energy manifests. Just think about this for a second really slowly. Don't go over it uh, quickly because you'll miss it. And it's incredibly important to think about. Point source energy manifests or generated from a point as in the case of this laser. Now, this is an LED laser. Yeah. The reason why basically 99% of all lasers today, nearly 99%, are LED lasers, because LED, and that's the reason why LEDs are so bad for your eyes, is LED energy is point source energy. And of course, it is actually coming from, and of course, is manifesting as energy out here. Of course, it's like, like a 300 milliwatt uh, red laser. It's coming from a pair of batteries that are in the back, but it's actually coming from a source. So point source energy manifests or generated from a point is force-based. And this, of course, the energy dissipation from the battery. And likewise, the energy directed towards a point is amplification and gain of what is already spatially existent, like the light telescope, like the radio telescope. So the energy is already there. And people incorrectly say magnify the energy. Are we magnifying light? It's seeing the exact same light your eyes do, but it's actually taking a large spatial sample, whether it be a radio telescope or a light telescope, a large spatial sample. It's bringing it to a point on the secondary 
bringing it back to uh, the the uh, uh, the collector, whether it be light or radio collector, and it's further actually uh, noises uh, dropped out because everything is S and R, signal to noise ratio. You're always trying to drop out the noise. Well, the noise exists in the case of lights. Like, why can't I see? And I'm looking at the exact same light that is falling at the exact same area on every uh, reflector, refractor telescope, or in the case of every uh, radio telescope. How come they can see that? Well, it's magnifying it. It's not. It's actually taking spatial dilution and it is making it point source. You're taking existing energy over a spatial sample, whatever that sample size is, and that's, of course, the size of the primary element of a reflector telescope. Refractors are just way, 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 way too friggin' expensive. So are enormous uh, reflector telescopes, but infinitely less so on a reflector telescope than it is on a massive refractor. You just can't make refractors anywhere near as big as reflectors. I mean, it's theoretically possible, but ultimately not really. They'd be way too fragile and way too heavy. So you're taking something that's spatially diluted and you're bringing it into concentration. So everything is, not my opinion, a fact, Signal over noise, S and R. This is a rock a rich guy gave me. You can even see the cross sample of the gold over here. You can see it over here. There is somewhere, I'm guessing, about $200 worth of gold in this. We could say that this uh, black host rock, which is uh, basically compacted black sand, would be the same thing as spatial dilution. It kind of almost looks like space since it's black. So there might be two or $300 worth of gold here, but what is this rock worth? It's worth about 20 bucks. Well, how could it be? There's like $300 of the gold there, maybe. Somewhere around there, I'm guessing, from what I actually even see. It's because what is potential is not actual. How do you... Because gold is gold is gold. Purification only means extraction. To extract the gold out of this host rock, I'm trying to make it simple here for everybody, is signal over noise. We could consider this black matrix, the noise, and of course the gold, which is the desirable component, the signal, that which we're interested in. So it's extraction of signal versus noise. We're getting to the point here on point source energy. So let's just rehash this once again, talking about point source energy. Anything that is generated from a point, as in the case of a magnet, by the way, because a magnet, of course, is a qualitative point source object. And I've got a diagram that I uploaded on the community forum I'd like you to take a look at, too. And it is... Uh, this diagram, I've actually taken the image of um, a uh, refractive element uh, and I doubled it and I had them pointing at the plane of inertia. This is the exact same field geometry as a magnet. This image is for download on the community page. This image is no different. It's the same field geometry as a dual magnifying glass or a refracting telescope. But the energy isn't coming from without the system as in the case of radio or in the case of a light telescope, um, but coming from within the system. It is part of the system itself, as in the case of a, a solid neodymium iron boron or a ferrite magnet. It is focused, of course, because before a magnet becomes a magnet, it is quantitatively 100% absolutely identical. 100% quantitatively identical. But the energy being focused is at the atomic level. They talk about uh, field coherency. No different than talking about a laser, for example. People say, well, a laser is light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. What a laser actually is is a point source object. Do you know how they created holograms before lasers existed? They used a pinhole aperture, and then they used a frequency filter of a mercury arc lamp. So they created holography before... Uh, uh, lasers exist. Everybody thinks, well, holograms didn't exist until lasers existed. And that's absolutely not true. Laser radiation is point source. Well, laser is coherent light. Attributionally, that's correct. But what a laser actually is, is point source light. Have you ever asked yourself the question, because this is a multiplicative field, a field effect, excuse me, multiplicative field effect, no different than talking about the magnifying glass versus the light falling in my hand. Multiplicative field effect. Why a 5 watt the light bulb is completely useless even to read a book by, yet a 5 watt laser will permanently and near instantly blind you and will burn a hole in your hand, burn a hole in a lot of stuff. Dangerous. I have a 5 watt blue laser. That sucker is powerful and really, really dangerous. I mean, you got to put on uh, 
frequency uh, goggles to even look at it at night, just shining it in the grass, just off of grass or pavement. It's just too power. It's only five watts. It's only five watts. What's the distinction between a five watt laser and a five watt light bulb? Multiplicative field effect. This is point source energy. Once again, all future inventions of any value, 100% of them, will be point source energy devices. So here I'm showing you in this diagram, I've just taken the, the refractive element of a reflector telescope and I doubled it and brought it up on top and brought it up on bottom. You have the exact same field geometry as that of a magnet. A magnet, if you slice it in half, each little section will immediately have its own, quote, North Pole and South Pole. A magnet doesn't have polarity. It has the three-dimensional force vector that extrapolates out the toroidal geometry of magnetism. It has this pressure point where the pressure mediates itself. Since the entire magnet, from top to bottom and every little atom, is, self, uh, is actually a point source object, it has simplex field coherency. The point source object... When you cut it, you're not actually changing anything about its field parameters. You're, yeah, then once you create two magnets or four or eight, for example, each little slice, not that you can really slice these ceramic magnets, will have its own plane of inertia, and each little slice, no matter how thin you slice it, will have its own, quote, North Pole and its own South Pole. Is this complicated? I hope I'm not making it complicated. This same magnet, once again, before being turned into a magnet, is no longer a magnet if it is degaussed or before it becomes a magnet, it is 100% identical, but we can't call it a magnet. It's just a ceramic neodymium iron boron lump or a, a, uh, a, a ferrite or sumerium cobalt lump piece of ceramic. It has no external magnetic effects. The only thing that fascinates anybody about a magnet is the fact that once it becomes a magnet, it is then a multiplicative field effect object. It is a point source object. Yeah, just as a 5-watt laser is super impressive, powerful, and dangerous versus a 5-watt laser, all of a sudden, now that it is a point source object, and it, you can watch any video on how magnets are made. You know, they compress them, they're ceramic, they're kind of fragile, they're basically like a piece of uh, dishware in your kitchen that's made out of ceramic. They're breakable, they're fragile. Once you make them, they're not impressive at all. And once they're gaussed up, the entire thing becomes a point source object where everything is operating in geomagnetic processional unison. And then the only thing that fascinates anybody about a magnet and makes it useful in millions and millions of devices, computers, cell phones, iPads, iPhone, everything, cameras, magnets, all over the place, is then the field becomes wah, ab extra to the object. If this were just a simple 300 milliwatt flashlight instead of a 300 milliwatt laser in order to turn it on it would be the most unimpressive flashlight on the face of this earth i mean even this as a laser is not super impressive but i could i could shine it down the street and see the little dot all the way at the end of the street a 300 milliwatt uh, flashlight i can't even shine it like in total darkness i can't even shine it like five feet and see the light. You know this is true, so what's the multiplicative field effect? Try to make it simple analogously. And it is very simple analogously. Multiplicative field effect, point source technology. So what is it about the magnifying glass that brings everything to a point that impresses people? How can you take that magnifying glass and burn steel, burn rock with it? Let's actually go on to some others. Here's the diagram from the lens and the focal plane. All I did was take this same diagram turned it on its side and doubled it to show you the exact same field geometry of a magnet. You're taking the light and you're removing the noise, which is spatial dilution. This is the case where we're actually taking existing energy and bringing it to a point. A laser and a magnet, for example, are examples of point source technology where you're taking energy of your own from a battery or from AC power lines, whatever the case might be, and you're starting with point source and sending out energy, point source energy with multiplicative field effect, laser, magnets, scalar energy, and also, too, field propulsion craft. Let's not use the word UFO that's so loaded and so awful. You know the reason why those craft come to a point on the edge, actually create a force vector 90 degrees relative to the vector of acceleration? Interesting, hmm? Um, yeah, talk about the pyramid magnets. Yeah, the same with the saucer-shaped craft, creating the magnetic field 90 degrees of the acceleration vector. 
magnet through a pipe, for example. I've shown that video countless times. So oh, that's a uh, that's the uh, what are they called? what's the effect called again? Uh, I can't think of the magnetic effect. They they have a name for it. And of course, it is not explicative of anything whatsoever. You drop a magnet through a pipe, it slowly decelerates. This is a simple lens law. Excuse me. Simple the demonstration of uh, of uh, the right hand rule where the actual magnet decelerates. You actually have a force vector of the magnetic field against the copper pipe and it actually decelerates. Of course, that's the limited power of the magnet. The gravity is still slowly dragging it down through the pipe. But the strong deceleration against gravity is no different than saying the strong force repulsion of a field propulsion craft. Gravity, for example, of course, is directed at nothing or not a thing. Two mutual objects in space, two or more objects in space, mutually directed at their acceleration, not towards each other, but at nothing. So-called magnetic attraction, which is not magnetism at all, they're both directed at nothing. That would be a point source, technically, counter space, which is anti force. What's an anti-force vector? That's an acceleration towards counter space. So-called gravity, so-called magnetic attraction, the so-called black hole, which of course is not a hole. It's of course a supermass with no magnitude. These are all vectors of acceleration. There's no such thing as a force of gravity. Gravity is the opposite of force. At the center of an acceleration of gravity, there is nothing there. That's not my opinion or a feeling or a belief. It's a 100% demonstrable fact. All vectors of acceleration are always, 100% of the time, always, always, always directed at nothing. Two objects. What's at the center of the Earth? I'm not talking to the, the flurfers here, by the way. There's nothing there. Your acceleration vector, if you jump up, ultimately at the center, there's nothing there. I'm not saying it's hollow. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying your acceleration vector is directed at nothing. Magnetic, so-called attraction, which is not magnetism at all. Dielectric acceleration is a vector towards nothing. Mutual mass acceleration in space, two or more objects, is directed at nothing. It's directed at counter space. You're taking spatial energy, and this is the reason why there's no straight lines in space. Everything is curvilinear, and there's always an acceleration vector towards counter space. I'd like to continue this on to part two. Thank you so much. Uh, part two, I said point two point source so much. By the way, before I get into uh, part two, um, I've had this for like five years. I think I paid like $120 for it. This is gallium. Gallium has made the news recently because uh, one country, I'll let you take a guess who, has uh, basically banned the export. But I had no idea it had been climbing up so much. I'm looking at about seven, I bought for, I think I had like $140 for this. This stuff melts in your hand. It looks like mercury, but it's not toxic. It's gallium. It's used in semiconductors. This stuff, since I bought it, I wished I'd known back then. At like $140 per kilogram is now, this is seven or eight times that much. Over $700 I have in my hand here of gallium. <laughs> I wish I could go back in time and pick up a bunch of gallium. I thought you'd find that interesting. Point source energy. Yes, this is part two. Sorry, that was my little distraction. I was so fascinated, I had no idea that gallium had gone up so crazy. I would love to go back in time and buy a lot of gallium. Self, message to self in the past, buy a bunch of gallium. I don't know why I brought this grapefruit out here. I thought I was going to make a simple analogy as everything is directed towards a null point between the two of uh, mass and magnitude, but specifically, once again, you know, gravity is, uh, is directed at nothing. So-called magnetic attraction is directed at nothing. This is non-Cartesian reality of ultimately inertia, or what you would call the ether. So-called black hole, matter is accelerating towards nothing. Of course, this is a supermass with no magnitude, where dielectricity overthrows magnetism's ability to keep the mass and matter within the visible universe, because the only reason anything has mass and magnitude is due to one thing and one thing only. Magnetism, when you have so much mass and it attains to point source or multiplicative uh, field energy, it vanishes from the universe. Dielectricity overthrows magnetism's ability to let that mass and matter have matter, I mean, have magnitude within the visible universe. So you have all the effects of the mass, but none of the magnitude, because magnitude 
is equal to magnetism and magnetism is overthrown and this complicates people's heads it messes with their minds but it's really 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 simple it's just simplex pressure mediation you still have the mass but you have none of the magnitudes like here's the mass you can still feel the effect of the mass on your hand for example but you can't see it or put your hand on it it's still there and it still has the effects of you know that you could feel uh, its weight and by the way weight has eight different variables but you actually can't see it and it would have absolutely zero magnitude in other words it would have no length width or depth because length width width and depth of course is relational to magnitude and magnitude only exists because of magnetism but if you have a supermass that has point source singularity of course I call a black hole a singularity but saying a singularity is no different than saying point source energy multiplicative field effect M F E multiplicative field effect multiplicative field effect is no more complicated than saying taking the light from the Sun and focusing it to the point that you know it will burn through steel or burn, burn through concrete multiplicative field effects no different than saying instead of saying a 300 milliwatt which I think what this what this is 300 milliwatt uh, flashlight which is totally useless a 300 uh, milliwatt uh, laser point source energy multiplicative field effect same is true of a magnet once again that's the only thing that fascinates any anybody on earth about a magnet everything is magnetoreactive ferromagnetic diamagnetic paramagnetic makes no difference everything is magnetoreactive that's the only thing that fascinates because the field becomes ab extra to the magnet and everybody's fascinated like it's magic wow look at this it has this so you accelerate and draws towards steel, you know, far out of the object. You know, there's no atoms or particles involved. Um, but that's a matter for another discussion, which, of course, I've, uh, you know, uh, dead horse that I've uh, been discussing. You talk about beating a dead horse, for example. Talked about that endlessly. Talk about the pyramid effect, a multiplicative field effect. One time you can actually truly say pyramid power exists is when you take a magnet and that is a double point source object. A magnet by itself is a point source object with multiplicative field effect because it has been brought into coherency. That is what a magnet is. It's a qualitative object, not a quantitative. Before a magnet becomes a magnet, it's the exact same object quantitatively. I keep emphasizing this because this is so important to understand magnetism and point source energy. Once again, I have to say, not my opinion, feeling, or belief, but 100% of all major inventions of the future that are going to change the shape of reality for humanity, such as sealed propulsion craft and fascinating technologies that are just wow-worthy, will all be 100% absolute certainty. I will predict the future for you now with undeniable certainty. 100% undeniable certainty. When have I ever said that in 7,000 videos? maybe once or twice 100 percent undeniable certainty will all be multiplicative field effect devices and inventions which is no different than saying point source energy objects this by the way is exactly how field propulsion craft not how i think it would work or i feel it would work or my opinion that it would work must work must work right hand rule you create a force vector 90 degrees to the vector of acceleration this causes deceleration you you amp it up even further and then you actually decelerate away from whatever your vector acceleration would normally be of the two objects. Um, talk about uh, deceleration, I had actually um, a point on here. Isn't amplification magnification? We're talking about dilution versus concentration. Spatially diluted energy, once again there's two different types of point source energy. One that takes existing energy like light and radio and it brings it to a point source because this is signal over noise. Same way microphones work, same way radio telescopes work, same way visible telescopes work. Signal over noise. You're taking something that's spatially diverse and you're bringing it to a point. The inverse of that is true like lasers and magnets. You're actually taking a field geometry and applying your own energy, excuse me, dissipating your own energy. You're actually applying the release of energy into that point source object for whatever purpose like a laser or a magnet to generate power. Scalar energy by the way which of course is a, a rarefaction compressor with no transverse component. Scalar energy for example. Um, once again at the telescope and the radio, you're, of course you're not seeing radio, you're, you're at the same level. You're just taking out the dilution factor of the noise 
Nobody can see. No telescope is actually magnifying an image. Sure it is. Everybody knows that. A reflector or a refractor telescope is magnifying. If you stick your, e your eyeball right next to the primary element or the first element of a refractor or a reflector, the same light that falls into your eye is the same light that falls into that telescope. What's the distinction? You have a spatial footprint of the primary, and it's taking all of that light and bringing it to a point. It's not magnifying anything. It's a distinction with the difference that nobody talks about. Does a telescope really magnify light, or is it a device with a specific geometry that, of course, focuses on, obviously and logically so, signal over noise? You're eliminating out the spatial variable, which is what you're doing. It primary goes to the secondary, which is a lot smaller. You're going from the footprint of the primary to the secondary, which is about like that. And then directed back towards uh, the receptor, like in the case of visible light. It's just nothing other than a super sensitive, super large, actually like nine inches by nine inches, charge coupling device. No different than a camera sensor, really, except a lot bigger and a lot more expensive and a lot more sensitive. It's a gain amplification. And of course, to eliminate out more of the noise, they're cryogenically cooled, and the signal receptors to eliminate out more noise. Same thing with microphone gain, concentration versus dilution. This is, once again, analogously spatial dilution among this host rock, where we got two or three hundred dollars of the gold here. Gold is gold is gold is gold, right? Why is that huge reflector telescope millions of dollars, but your eyeballs are essentially worthless except to you? Because it's a device for eliminating out spatial noise. Space, even though it has no properties, is a dilution of energy. And that makes sense because all force and the creation of space is magnetism. It is the vector of centrifugal divergence and of energy dissipation. What's the opposite of energy dissipation? Pretty sure it's energy concentration. What's another word for concentration? Wouldn't concentration be a reference to point source energy? Why, yes it would be. Man, that makes things a lot more simple, doesn't it? Concentration versus dilution is light spatially and radio, which of course is also a form of invisible light. It's all EMR, electromagnetic radiation, spatially diluted, signal over noise. So receptor dish, magnet, magnifying glass, dish, laser, field propulsion craft, which operates off of the right-hand rule. You ever notice the edges of which are pointed exactly no different? Say you had a pyramidal magnet, except it went around the vector of the edge of the dish-shaped object. And, of course, the flying object itself with the field propulsion craft doesn't have to be saucer-shaped, but it makes a lot of sense because that is the vector at which the magnetic field is amplified relative to the vector of acceleration, and this causes deceleration. How much is amped up? You go deceleration, full stop, more power, reverse. Reverse to the normal vector of acceleration, of mutual mass acceleration, or so-called gravity, which is not a force, rather an inertia. All energy made from or concentrated to a point source has multiplicative uh, power effect and, of course, near magic-like properties. The discussion of this is incredibly important. Nobody talks about it. And without surprise, once again, who's discussing this online? And the answer is nobody. I actually like to go further on this, but I think it might bore people talk about dendritic or Lichtenberg patterns of uh, energy dissipation from a mass medium, and the reason why uh, lightning, for example, and Lichtenberg patterns have that fern-like, beautiful pattern that people love to admire, actually says a lot, and it gives affirmation to the ether, but that's a matter for another discussion. But that's also, too, a point source discharge, but people don't agree. It's like, well, it's not a point source discharge because lightning discharges in dendritic um, uh, Lichtenberg patterns, for example, like uh, dissipation of uh, x-ray capacitance and clear lucite, it is dendritic. You know, it's not directed at a source. It is. It's just that's the lowest pressure mediation at which discharge can occur. And this actually gives confirmation to the ether because Lichtenberg patterns and that dendritic pattern would not exist if the ether didn't exist. You know, all of these quantum and relativists that have uh, reified atoms and denied the ether, it's like, well, Dendritic patterns wouldn't exist if the ether didn't exist. 
Yeah, completely impossible, but that's a matter for another discussion. I'd love to talk about that. Um, Nature is really, really simple. You have point source energy directed towards counter space, where you're actually eliminating out the noise. Yeah, really, really simple. Spatial dilution, no different than the gold scattered amongst this black matrix rock. Spatial dilution, bringing it to a point. Examples, magnifying glass. What well, is another example? Radio telescope. Isn't that a spatial collector with a huge footprint that's bringing everything to a point? Well, yes, it is! What's another perfect example to make nature really simple? Oh, what about this really expensive, large uh, reflector telescope? It's taking that large spatial footprint of light that is spatially uh, diverse and bringing it to a point. This is a secondary mirror up here. It goes, bounces from the secondary down to the collector, which is, passes through the hole of the primary. Kind of makes things really simple. Makes explaining a magnet really easy, too. Because a magnet, before it becomes a magnet, is 100% quantitatively identical. Except now, it's a point source object. Except the energy is not coming from without. You know, a magnet's not taking in energy. It itself is a multiplicative object. And this is why the magnetic effect is ab extra outside of the magnet which is the reason why all these magnetic devices and our phones and our cameras and whatnot exist. And by the way, I've talked about this endlessly too, talking about counter space. When you dial up the power on a magnet more, this uh, magnetic field actually vanishes further and further. The reason why is because a magnet is primary, prim primarily a point source object rooted in non-Cartesian counter space, i.e. the plane of inertia, you could say, or the point source, uh, uh, point source locus at the center of the field. It's not at the center of the magnet. It's at the center of the field pressure mediation. This is the reason why people email me. It's like, why does a super powerful magnet have a smaller magnetic field around it? I mean, it's very palpable. You have to get it a lot closer to the steel to feel the magnetic effect. Because what powers that magnet is not magnetism, rather dielectricity. And magnetism, of course, is the dielectric field. This is divinely simple. This is Occam's razor. This is simplicity uh, personified. Understanding multiplicative field effect, simple objects that basically everybody's familiar with, magnifying glasses, lasers, magnets, multiplicative field effect, and magnets. Uh, point source energy, magnets, magnifying glasses, lasers, uh, radio telescope dishes, uh, refractors or reflector telescopes, makes no difference. Either taking the energy and eliminating out the noise, and the noise is the spatial uh, dilution, the spatial dilution of the signal. You want, you want the signal, you don't want the noise. Well, the dilution of that signal, of course, is spatial. You eliminate out the spatial component, then you have signal amplification, and that is gain. And that is point source energy. That is the premise behind multiplicative field effect, of which, by which, and undeniably so, once again, is the basis of 100% of all future amazing tech. What do they call it? Amaza. They have a word for it. It's called amaze, amaze tech or something like that. It's a, kind of a funny word, amaze tech. In other words, it's technology that's just like, wow! We're all jaded by magnets and lasers now, but those are point source objects. Lasers and magnets, if you think about it, make up about 90% of every technological doodad that we use. The camera that's filming me, this freaking computer, this freaking iPad, this freaking camera, my watch, your cell phone, everything! There's probably thousands of magnets in your vehicle, easily. We just don't think about it. Well, who cares? Yeah, magnets, meh. <laughs> I hope you liked this video. It was a long video, but I needed a further explanation to get into the topic of this discussion. Uh, if you ever want to contact me, my email is below. Any donation is always very warmly welcome because I'm not selling anything other than leather goods, which actually hurts my hands. And that donation link is below. Don't have to do anything. I read every comment. Lux Everitas. I love discussing this super, super important topic because it is that important. It is. Thank you so much. Booyah! <laughs>